Good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? Well, Merry, Happy Christmas Eve to you. We're glad you're here with us this morning at New Life Fellowship. And we would like to say that this evening we are going to have another service at 5 o'clock. If you'd like to come back and we'll have a little uh, kind of an acoustic little service for Christmas Eve. Amen. So rise to your feet. We will begin our praise and worship here at New Life Fellowship. This is all important news, so that's why we're doing Do You Hear What I Hear? Amen. Said the night wind to the little lamb Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite, with a tail as big as a kite. Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Merry Christmas! Yeah. We're glad that you've chosen to be here to worship with us today. Um, we can say happy birthday to Jesus, or you can celebrate um, by doing that. A lot of times Kim does a cake and puts happy birthday Jesus, especially for the children's department. But today we're not going to have children's uh, church, so the children will stay in here for worship with us today. Uh, tonight we have a Christmas Eve service at five o'clock so we hope that you can come uh, we'll have a little skit and a lot of music with ted so y'all come and celebrate with our candlelit service tonight uh, a lot of activities are canceled this week wednesday ladies are canceled and uh, bible study on wednesday night is canceled but the youth they're going to throw something in there they're going to have a lock-in see they're going to make up for it all night long so <laughs> If you want to talk to Amanda or Jean about the lock-in for the youth, you could do that. That's on December the 27th. And so, um, did we have a birthday or a wedding anniversary this past week? Oh, we did. I know. I saw this yesterday. <laughs> um.
You had a birthday? You did not have a birthday. Mm. That's the only person that could put up with you, huh? You, yourself, and I, three people. <laughs> Happy anniversary, you two. Thank you. Okay. And did you have a birthday, Miss Bobby? You did. Okay. Happy anniversary. I know, 56 years. Okay. All right, we do have a children's story today, so before we ask the children to come for the children's story, uh, Miss Nikki will come and bring that story. Let's ask the Lord to bless our service today. Father, I come into your presence and thank you for this day. And Father, I do thank you for the meaning of this special day. I just pray, Lord, that as you come to be our Savior, that we would each accept you as such, Father, that we would worship you as King of our life, Lord of our life. I pray that you'd be with the children as they come, Father, that you'd touch their hearts and help them be receptive to your word. And we just pray that you'd be with the feathers of the service as we sing these Christmas carols, that you would receive them with honor and glory. And we just give you thanks for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. So we had, what did we have first? Anybody remember? Hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. And then we had peace. And then we had joy. Any guesses as to what today is? Well, love. The white candle is the Christ candle, but it got blew, blown out. But this is love. Jesus is love. Well, when we talk about Advent, Advent is about waiting. It's about anticipation and quiet. Have any of you had much quiet lately? Me either. The Christmas season can be busy. You have the elf on the shelf. You have the Grinch. You have gingerbread house decorating. You have decorating and lights and baking and matching Christmas pajamas. And you have to go to the Polar Express and have movie watching days that are themed and presents to buy and wrap and mail and Santa visits. And the world is screaming that we have to make it this perfect magical Christmas. And as we do it, it's hard to find the quiet when the world is screaming busy. My favorite Christmas book that, of course, we couldn't find this morning is called Santa's Christmas Prayer. And it talks about how all that busy stuff that is so, so fun. It's not wrong. It's so fun. I love it all. You give me a matching pajama day any day and I'll be there. It is so much fun. But it's about Santa's simple prayer. And that Santa's simple prayer in that book just says that all the children, he just prays that they don't miss the important part. What's the important part? Jesus. Jesus came as a baby to show the world a love that they had never experienced. We have no idea the kind of love that Jesus was going to bring into the world. So this day, the last day really of the Christmas season, and this coming year, I want you to sit in the waiting and look for Jesus and share the love this season. Let's pray. Precious Jesus, thank you for coming, and thank you for showing us a love that we don't know, 
except through you. Help us to share that with others and help us be a light in the dark world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise to your feet. We will continue our praise and worship this morning.
that you have shown us the way, loved us enough to send us a sign, a Savior, for each and every one of us. Not just me, not just my wife or my family, but for everyone. The almighty creator of heaven and earth cares and desires to spend time with each of us. So, Father, we thank you and praise you. We pray it's not just this day or the next, but every day of our lives when we know you personally. In Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen. Merry Christmas. I don't get to say that all the time. Doesn't sound so good, say, in July. So are you all ready for tomorrow? Got, got any last-minute shopping, anybody? Anybody putting up a tree today? Um, anybody else? Anybody else doing uh, like gathering today? Yeah, the gardeners are, are doing a big thing today. Anybody? Anybody got big gathering plans tomorrow? That might be a little bit more common. The day is nearly here. I was just thinking, Ted was uh, doing this last song with the worship team. What's the name of that song, by the way? We Three Kings. Find that scripture. O open up your Bible. Find, find where it says there were three kings, by the way. Anybody, anybody know? Well, there, there's kings there in Matthew. But you know that your Bible doesn't actually say that there were three kings. Do you got an idea where that might have come from? The idea of the three? There were gifts. What were those gifts? We're, we're going to do a Christmas quiz while I'm here. Oh, you all sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. <laughs> Frankincense, myrrh, gold. Or you could do it in the actual biblical order, that's fine. These magi, okay, there's a question for you. Magi, what does that mean? Anybody know? That's not a word you use very often. It's actually Greek. Magi was the name given to what we would call today wise men. By the way, if you open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 2, some of your Bibles might say wise men. Some might say magi. These wise men came. And apparently, whatever number they were, they came bearing gifts. I want to read through the actual text here in Matthew today. Matthew chapter 2 tells us about these wise men, about the Magi. I want to read through the text. And of course, sorry to say, Ted, the, the text is not going to tell us that there were three of them. There, there's going to be some things from the song that isn't really in your Bible. But I want to take a look at what they were doing and what they were bringing. So if you've got your Bible handy, take a look at Matthew chapter 1. Or sorry, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. 
In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the town of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Wink, wink, right? You, you understand that. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Is there anything here in this text that tells you who these magi, wise men, were? Is there anything in the text that tells you where they came from? Came from the east. We have no location. People have lots of speculation about who they were and where they came from. But Matthew in his gospel chose not to fill all that in. Matthew chose to tell us about some wise men who found out that a king was to be born, the king of the Jews. They journeyed to find that king. They stopped to find where he was actually to be. They were told to go to Bethlehem. When they arrive in Bethlehem, we know what they did. Verse 11, they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't need to know who they were or where they came from, and especially how many of them there were. All that Matthew wanted to make sure was that they came to see Jesus and when they found him, they worshipped him and gave him gifts. That's it. You can speculate all you want about the number, about who they were, where they were from, but the simple gospel story is that they just came to find Jesus and worship him. That's it. Now, I got to tell you all a funny little story. Nikki came up here and was talking about her favorite Christmas book. I'll tell you about mine. When I was in six, when I was teaching sixth grade, for many of those years that I taught, I would have my students read aloud a children's novel. Real short book, just a few chapters. It was called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. Anybody ever hear of that? For those of you that have not read or at least heard, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, written by Barbara Robinson. And in this story, there's a town, a school in that town, a church in that town, it's all we know. We don't know the, the, the name of the place and we, and we don't know any more detail, but the church in the town is putting on a nativity story. For years, the tradition has been set in stone over who shall play which roles in that nativity story, how the nativity story is told. Well, Concurrently with that, we find out that in this town, in this school, is basically the rowdiest, most delinquent kids you could ever imagine. They start by burning down a shed with a chemistry set. Fire department called to, to put it out, and then they steal the donuts that people brought for the fire department. 
the Herdman family comes to church because they heard at school about this nativity story. And they also heard that they give away candy at Christmas. Well, the Herdmans come to take the church candy. But while they're there, they hear about this nativity story. And throughout the story, the Herdmans basically Shanghai the nativity play that the church normally does. The most rotten criminal kids in the whole town end up taking all of the main roles in the nativity play. Mary, Joseph, the angel, the wise men, the shepherds. Six herdmans in this family, all six of them take the prime roles. But they've never once heard the nativity story. They don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything about Bethlehem. But here's the neat thing about the book. They have to learn. They have to learn it from scratch. They have to be told the nativity story. And so as my students read the best Christmas pageant ever, they got to literally read the nativity story. Somebody's got a phone going, something. Yeah. The herdmans hear about the nativity for the very first time and they have questions that just doesn't make sense. One of them is about these wise men. What is it that they brought? What is the gold? What is frankincense and myrrh? They had found out that Jesus was to be born a, a little baby. Well, the herdmans know what it's like to be a little homeless child. They're homeless. They brag about how they raised, the, the older herdmans brag about how they raised the younger herdmans, keeping the youngest one in a cupboard shelf. They live without any parent supervising them. So when they hear that this little baby refugee kind of Jesus gets these gifts, they want to know what they're like. And why should this baby need gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, let's look at them. Let's look at gold, frankincense, and myrrh and see What's significant about these gifts? The first one is gold. Anybody here not know what gold is before we get too far along? That, that one you're probably more familiar with than the other two. Gold, of course, is the precious metal. Gold is talked about in the Old Testament. It was used in worship. Let me show you in Exodus. This is with Moses. In Exodus chapter 25, when uh, through the Mosaic law, worship of God was being established, gold played a role. Verse 10 there in verse 25 says, have them make an ark of acacia wood. You're all familiar with the ark, right? You've seen it, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> have them make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. And then verse 17 continues. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Gold was used in worship. There's a, a, a divinity attached to gold. It's such a precious thing. Kings were the ones who had gold. Gold also plays a role, talking about divinity, in Revelation. Are you familiar with this? In Revelation chapter 21, verse 21 says, The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great, the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. When John had his vision, his revelation... He got to see what the new heavens and the new earth would be like. The new Jerusalem. 
apparently he saw the streets paved with gold. And it's not the impure kind of gold that we're familiar with. This is transparent, so pure you can see through it. Gold is a divine thing. So can you see why it might be significant for the wise men, the magi, to bring gold to Jesus? Is there some divinity in that little baby in the nativity account? Yeah. Frankincense. Did you know that frankincense also shows up in the Old Testament? Frankincense, any, anybody familiar with what frankincense is? Last part of the word might help you out. Incense, frankincense. It is made from an Arabic tree that uh, resin is taken from it, gum. And from that gum is made an aroma, a, a fragrant thing. In Exodus chapter 30, still in there with Moses, it shows up that this frankincense or this incense was to be burned and to be used daily in worship. Every morning when Aaron maintains the lamps, he must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he lights the lamps, he must again burn incense in the Lord's presence. This must be done from generation to generation. Incense was to be used when the priest went into that altar there in the tabernacle. There was some significance in that smoke rising up. The psalmist, David, in Psalm 142, even associated that idea of the incense and its rising to prayer. I call to you, Lord, come quickly to me. Hear me when I call you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Incense was used in worship. It was used in sacrifices. It was used in prayer. Can you see how that might be associated with that little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Is there something to be prayerful there? Is there something to worship? Yes. Myrrh. Did you know that myrrh is a lot like frankincense? It comes from the resin of a tree. Myrrh has really got two uses that we see. One is that from the times of ancient Egypt, myrrh was used in the embalming process. You understand what happens with decaying bodies, right? For a body to be kept out needed something to cover that smell. So myrrh was used in the embalming process. But it was also used, mixed, in drink, to make a, a bitter kind of, of drink, which, by the way, shows up in the New Testament, in the Gospels. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, Jesus is being taken to the cross. He's being prepared and ready to be put atop the cross. And in verse 23, we see, They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Myrrh was at the crucifixion. That's what Jesus was offered. Verse 36, someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar. Guess what that wine vinegar is made with? Myrrh. Put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. But what happens with Jesus? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Myrrh is associated with death. Do you see how that might be significant for that little baby in Bethlehem? Each of these gifts were appropriate in a way. 
Jesus, of course, is divine, the Son of God. Jesus is worthy of praise and worship. But Jesus was ultimately that Lamb of God who was sacrificed on the cross for us. Each of those gifts were significant in their own role. Now let me take you back to the Herdmans. I was telling you about the Herdmans trying to learn the nativity story and they had tons of questions. And when they hear about the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, they just can't understand it. They, they first of all have to be told what each is. But then once they're told... It just is incomprehensible to them. What would a baby boy need with some incense? What in, the, what in the world would a baby do with that? Well, in the story, the Herdmans take over the church nativity play. And that night... Everyone in town comes. They flock in greater numbers than they had ever seen before. They all come to see how horrible it turns out with the herdmen's running the whole place. But it's interesting how Barbara Robinson turns the story. The herdmen's change the nativity of story and make it personal to them. The angel of the Lord, instead of being prim and proper and glorious, shouting, unto you, a child is born, comes running through the auditorium, screaming at the top of his lungs, waving arms. Come see this baby! Everybody is aghast. This isn't the way the nativity is supposed to go. But it's the exact thing that the Herdmans understand. When it comes to the Magi showing up, the Magi are supposed to bring these kind of gilded boxes that the church had set up and had used for years in the nativity play. But the three Herdman boys who are supposed to be the Magi, they don't bring these nice formal boxes. They brought a canned ham. You see, the Children Protective Service, who oversees these kids, had given their family the ham for Christmas. It was the most valuable thing that they had in their whole, whole possession. And after hearing the nativity story and who Jesus really was, they thought it would be appropriate for them to bring the most valuable, precious gift that they could think of. And so they bring literally the canned ham from the State Department. Well, we don't have canned ham here for Jesus. But have you ever thought, what is it that is an appropriate gift? What would be an appropriate gift? What is it appropriate for, here for the Magi to bring? What is appropriate for us to give to the Lord? Turns out that whenever you have a question, the best place to look is right there on your lap. It's the Bible. The prophet Micah, years before the nativity, years before the Magi showed up with their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, Micah had the exact same question. What is it that we should give to the Lord? Micah chapter 6. If you want to turn over, you're, you're welcome to it. But Micah wants to know, what is it that he can give to God? Micah chapter 6, verse 6. 
With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He wants to give what God should deserve. And here's the conclusion that he comes to. He has showed you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Nikki was talking about the busyness of the season and and all the the gift giving and the parties and and the, the family visits. All of those busy things that we do during the holiday because we feel obligated to, we got to get these things done. I, I have a checklist and I'm trying not to look at Kim. There's a checklist. All the things to get done. And we feel like we have to do them. They're our responsibility. We're obligated. We must do them. But really, whether it's Christmas time, time of remembering Jesus' birth, or any day of the year, what does the Lord require of you? What is it that we're supposed to do? Are we supposed to bring gold and frankincense and myrrh? Is that what God really wants of us? Does he want rivers of oil, sacrifices galore? God wants us to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly. That's it. That's what we're to do. Christmas can be kind of confusing. There are so many things that are tied now to Christmas. When Christmas is really just a celebration of Jesus' birth. It's much more than the consumerism. It's much more than, than the display. It's about God sending his son to grow from a baby to be a person like us, to experience the pains of, of life. And to eventually become that sacrifice, that Lamb of God on the cross for our sin. That's what Christmas is. All the rest of it are things that we've just added to it. Are they somehow necessary? No. Are they really that important? No. Christmas is about Jesus coming. Jesus is the very first gift. The gold, the frankincense, and myrrh were not the first gift. Jesus himself is our gift. Now I'm going to ask, have you received Jesus? Has he been Lord of your life? If not, there is no better day than today to make him Lord of your life. The Bible tells us that if you have faith in Jesus, you can be saved. It's all it takes. Faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus did on that cross for us. If you can put your faith in him this morning... There's no better news, there's no better gift to give this morning than to be a believer. We need to act justly, we need to love mercy, we need to walk humbly. But that walk humbly part, we kind of step over. We put ourselves first and foremost way too often instead of putting God first. If you can put your faith in Jesus, that means that you step aside 
and put him, put the Lord first. That's that humbleness. If you can do that, that's the best gift of all this Christmas. I'm going to ask Ted to bring up our, our worship team. And why don't you all stand with me here as we get set to close. There's nothing better than to give your life to Jesus, to accept who he is and the truth of, of what that Bible you were just looking at says about him. If you have not put your faith in him, today is that day. And I'm going to stand here and we're going to have everybody sing here in a few minutes to have a, an invitation. And really it's a, an invitation to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we get to come before you. We come today uh, on this Christmas Eve, this uh, season that we remember your birth. And we just ask for that right relationship to be with each person here. That we could be humble and understand who you are pray that uh, you just fill us with the spirit that uh, as we leave here we we trust in you we believe in you and we share that faith in, in everything that we do i pray in your name amen the angels did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so What's everybody doing tonight at 5 o'clock? Be back here. We are going to have a Christmas Eve service. Uh, let me tell you what's going on with that program. Uh, we're going to have Ted leading music uh, with uh, an opening song, and then we're going to do something we haven't done before. We're going to have a group of folks that uh, have been asked to help read aloud the nativity story. Just as you got to hear uh, about the Magi account, about the wise men and what the scripture really says, we're going to look at the entire uh, scripture of the nativity and read that aloud with you all tonight. We're going to have a communion service, Lord's Supper service, and then Ted's going to have some songs. Jane's going to be here playing, uh, but I want to invite you all, please, be here at 5 p.m. And I'm going to ask those of you that uh, had volunteered and had agreed to help me out with the read aloud, would you come uh, a little early just so we can get some things squared away before everybody gets here? So we'll start like 5 or about 4.30ish, 4.35, something like that for those folks. All right. Ted, you got a song to close us? Sure. Would you pray and close us then? Will do. Please bow with me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, so thankful 
for all the gifts that you give us, Father. For most of all, your Son and the salvation that he brings. Because, Father, we forget, like as was said in our children's story, all the hustle and bustle, all the things going on. Father, we pray and thank you for the peace to take a breath and to look up and see you. So, Father, we tell you we love you with all of our hearts and all of our minds and pray that we would continue to worship you day in, day out for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Reach out and take the hand of somebody next to you. You know, the more I think about this song, I know we do it every Sunday. But as much as he loves us, wow. Amen. Loving God. bless y'all and keep you and make his face to shine upon you hope to see you this evening